Hello, and welcome back to Dedication. Fans remember the Bay City Rollers. This week, we're back with Wayne Coy, the author of the book Bay City Babylon, the unbelievable but true story of the Bay City Rollers. Last week, we ended our session by asking Wayne when and how he decided to write the book. Uh, this week's session, we'll find that out. And we also will delve into the inception of the original Idols tour that featured the Bay City Rollers, Barry Williams, or as we know him, Greg Brady, Leif Garrett, the Cal Sills, and more. Let's check back in with Wayne. So the book came out in 2005 initially. Now, did the Where Are They Now interviews and, and um, research, like, like, was that the the genesis of the book or how how did that happen and tell us about the process all right so my wife at the time um was at home it was a regular day during the week i was living in tucson arizona and uh i had always been a program director slash morning dj right and this job was the first one that I had in years where I wasn't the program director. I was I was only the uh, the lowly morning man, right? So what that equaled was um, way less hours as a radio station and way more hours around the house. And the real fact of the matter is, it was driving my wife crazy. Yeah. What is that slot? The six to ten? The six a.m. to ten a.m. slot? Yeah. Yeah, you were so home at 11. Good. That was not good. <laughs> right. She was used to me being at the station all day, doing, being, being a guy wearing two hats. You know, I would literally work from like 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. You oh, know? boy. And, uh, now, all of a sudden, I'm coming home at, you know, 11 a.m. And, yeah, so she came to me and she said, listen, you either need to take up golf or collecting stamps or something, but you need to find a hobby and you need to find it quick because you're driving me crazy. Oh, yeah. I have a routine. You know, she was a housewife. I hate to use that term because I know it's kind of demeaning, but she was a domestic goddess. Yeah. And, and she just said, look, you're in my space and you're driving me crazy. So find something. So I'm like, hey, okay, don't ask me twice, you know? So I, I went upstairs and I got out some boxes and I'm just literally digging through going, okay, is it going to be baseball cards or, uh, you know, what have I got in the box that might inspire me to do something? And I literally pulled out uh, this envelope and in the envelope, manila envelope, pretty dog-eared, were the cassettes from my interviews with uh, Alan and, and Woody and, and Duncan, and uh, a bunch of, you know, written notes. You know, you listen to cassette and you transcribe it, and, sure. you know, you want to make sure you get your quotes right, you know, so all of that. So it was just all sitting there, and, it, you know, keep in mind, this is 2000, uh, maybe 2002, mm. three? Yeah, maybe 2003. And... You know, so this stuff's already almost 20 years old. And I, I immediately went, wait a minute, you know what? Nobody has ever written, like, a book. I mean, and I'm not talking about the Tam Payton book or the, right. the Michael, whatever his name was. But I mean, this wasn't, you know, I don't mean like a glossy fan book, you know, where you talk about their their favorite, you know, flavor of ice cream. Right. Right. Uh, Nobody ever did a real biography on the band. And I thought back to, you know, knowing how much Eric opened up to me playing slots in, in uh, Lake Tahoe, that these guys I mentioned, you went to them and said, look, I'm writing a serious book about, you know, you as a rock band, uh, because you deserve it. You've sold a bajillion records and you have a huge fan base. Why don't we why don't we do this thing? So anyway, off to the races. You know, I'm not knowing at all how hard it is to write a, a biography, especially about uh, you know, a band that's not together anymore, that's splintered all over the place, a lot of bad, you know, juju between the members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, half of them are in the UK, the others are who knows where. So it, it was a lot more of a, of a challenge than I thought it was going to be. Um, that said, I had a lot of hours to kill, and, and boy did I. 
so from Tucson, we moved back to uh, Alabama. Even though my inner voice was telling me how, I did it anyway. <laughs> uh, went back to Alabama and locked myself away and just kept writing and calling and interviewing. And uh, I approached everybody who I thought could have any sort of meaningful take on the group. Um, and, you know, if you were looking at it from a percentage point, as far as actual participation, people who said, sure, let's talk. As you're probably, you know, learning yourself doing your podcast. Yeah. You know, you get about, if you get about 300, you're doing good. You know, if you get three out of 10 to say yes. Uh, of the members themselves, um, you know, Nadi was happy to talk. Ian certainly had no problem talking. Duncan was fine. Uh, Les loved the idea and was initially went into having a conversation and then he, he told me, he goes, you know what, he goes, I'm writing a book too and if I talk to you, I'm going to end up telling you all the stories that are going to end up being in my book. So that doesn't make any sense. So for that reason, I got to say, I'm just going to take a pass. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Eric, which I appreciated, at least he was candid. Um, the rest were, you know, Derek was thanks but no thanks. Uh, Alan and I did have a uh, conversation, which was good. So he participated. It wasn't as long as the previous one, but, you know, a lot of the stuff he told me also ended up being not really, you know, earth shattering news because it was all covered the first time I talked to him. Sure. Uh, and thankfully, I had gobs from Woody, I had just a ton. That never saw the light of day from the from that interview in '84, and it was all history stuff. You know, it was his relationship with the other members and Tan, and you know what he thought the rollers meant in the big picture, and you know. So I was glad to have that. And then the rest, as any biographer has to deal with at some point, you know, you just have to go source material. And I did say to all of them, like, look, and even you know, even to Les and Eric, I said, you know, I would so much rather have an opportunity for you to tell me your story from your perspective with your spin because it's going to be different than the other guys but at least you have a chance to control the narrative um you know to, to whatever degree you know i'm gonna i'm gonna take what you say and put it in the mix yeah and uh, i was a little surprised that they all didn't see the value in that but you know, that's why they call it an unauthorized biography, and we all do what we can to get the, get the real story. And that was my whole thing from Jump Street, was I'm like, hey, I am really not going to go into this with any sort of uh, perspective. I'm not on one member's side or another's. You know, we'll let the chips fall where they are, and they'll either participate or they won't. And then I'm going to have to, you know, rely on anything they may have ever said in the past uh, if it relates to that moment. And, you know, it, looking back on it, I mean, it's the first effort to write a book. Quite an undertaking. I'm proud of it. I, I would love to, you know, there's a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas, and, uh, you know, we can all say that, right? You just you have to live with it once and all, and you go, hey, at the end of it, are you, are you proud of it? And the answer is, you know, the response that I've gotten from most people, especially people who aren't in that inner clique, because I didn't want to write it for the, you know, for the, you know, the people that live and die with the rollers because they, yeah. they probably want to more than I was ever going to find out anyway. Right. Uh, you know, it's not. And so that would be the yeah. common uh, critique from someone who was a hardcore roller fan as well. It's nothing new, is it? I, and I would say, yeah, it is. Because, you know, who, who else talked to Sid Bernstein? Who else spent this much time with Tam Payton? Who else talked to Clive Davis? Who yeah. else talked to Mike Kleffner? You know, I mean, they're, they're, the, everybody that I thought could speak to um, their time in the band or around the band either participated or I was able to include their perspective and you know up until I think there's a, a book that came out a couple of years ago that uh, boy you know oh yeah. the Spence book yeah, yeah that thing yeah. is uh, that's a big book I don't yes, know that I've even gone through it because it's it's a, a tough read it's, it's it's very a tough hard read. the first the first part of the the first half of the book I thought um, you know, of course, I wish I hadn't read it, but I found the first half to be super tedious. 
he just went into so much minutia that I thought was, I don't know, just didn't add anything. But I, I just wish I'd never read it. See, and you're and you're a fan, and you know, and a, and a big fan. So imagine someone who, uh, as I say at the beginning of my book, is aided recall. You know, right. you, guys, you guys know this. You talk about the rollers, and you literally have to sing Saturday night sometimes for them to go. Oh yeah, right. You know, right. from San Francisco? Uh, no, you know, they they don't know. Uh, yeah, and, and so it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, so when I wrote the book, the idea was write a book that is going to hopefully hold the attention of the super fan because there'll be enough new material there that, you know, that maybe they maybe they never got to hear what Sid Bernstein thought or what Clyde Davis thought or right. whatever. But, but for the uninitiated, for the person who just hasn't thought about them since 76, um, What's that feedback like? And I will tell you that at the end of the day, that's the most valuable feedback because they didn't go into reading the book with any sort of preconceived notions. And usually what I get back at the end of it is, whoa, I never had any idea that they went through all this stuff. Exactly. And to yeah. band members' credit, they, you know, they all deserve uh, utmost respect um, for, for having gone through what they've gone through because... It was a whirlwind, and as you know, there were so many extenuating circumstances, and and uh, you know, there there were there were facts of life that they just sort of had to deal with once they became card carrying members of that band, and uh, you know, and it's it's sad. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. It's it's just bittersweet and sad because they deserved better. They really did. Absolutely. Yeah. And you kind of answered my next question about the, the, the ride or die fans who, you know, anything that you said that didn't involve milk and teddy bears and cuddling, um, they were just going to freak out and, you know, leave a bad review. So you kind of covered that. And Laura, I'm not going to correct you, but I think when you meant you wish you never read the book, not because it isn't a well written book, but it's because it's so, so, so dark. It, yeah, so dark. It's, it's very dark. And, you know, I, I was one of those fans that totally believed their, their milk drinking image. And. Oh, I'm sorry, I know, Laura. But it makes me really sad to think that at the height of their popularity, when I loved and worshipped everything about them, that behind the scenes they had you know that awful Tam Payton behind them driving the bus and yeah as an adult it makes me sad oh I want to hug you right now <laughs> I know it's stupid I'm sorry I shouldn't no it's not you. stupid it's it, it's you know it's who we are and what we do yeah <laughs> sorry okay <laughs> alright Wayne bring some madness up in here <laughs> well, I just wanted to say on the record that when speaking about a, uh, a dark book uh, that uh, Laura was in no way speaking of my book Simon just uh, quite. Absolutely no not. absolutely not absolutely not and I, got, I got a hard time because you know and, and again it's what it should have could have but I was like okay I, there was a chapter in the uh, in the book which uh, I think we might have taken out completely on the second because we did a we did an updated version in 2015, ten years later. Mm -hmm. um, I did a chapter where I interviewed these girls that all had one thing in common, and that's that they were all down in LA. Um, you know, they were like super, super fans who got to get close to them all while they were down there, and you know, hang out with them at La Park and yeah. go to the and tapings and right. all that stuff. And, um, you know, the stories they told, which, by the way, aren't my stories, they're their stories, mm -hmm. were, uh, were not received really well by a lot of... Uh, a lot of the fans because they thought it was just okay why'd you need to go there you know we didn't we didn't need that it's like a little too little too yeah. and um but you know, a story though yeah but, but I, I see what they're saying anyway at the time you know I thought, I thought it was different I thought hey let's hear what these girls all went through because it's different than some girl who was just a fan and uh you know, bought 16 magazine every month and had them on the wall and then kind of forgot about them 
you know, by yeah. 1980 and moved on to, you know, Rick Springfield or whatever. Now, right? now uh, the anniversary edition did not include that chapter, am I right? Because I think I missed it. I read, I read the second edition. Good. Okay, because you, you're doing a better job of remembering than me. Because remember, now that's already been five years ago. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it was a conscious decision to listen to the criticism that I felt was pretty well founded in that uh, it was such a departure from the rest of the narrative in the book that it stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, I'm not saying that it was bad to have, but I, I just didn't see the point. Was the, so, was the criticism from the, you know, the milk drinking fans or was it from the girls themselves? Did they not feel well, represented? I don't know because I never drank milk with anything. So <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it was, yeah, I, I would say to, to be... Uh, my perspective on that is it was probably the ones who were like, listen, don't, you know, it's one thing that we have to hear about the drug usage and that we have to hear about, you know, Tam's ulterior motive and we have to hear about, you know, this or that, whatever it might have been. But seriously, do we have to hear about, you know, some, some girl who, you know, was basically a groupie who ended up sleeping with a member of the band or whatever? Yeah. Now you're in Caroline Sullivan territory and, you know, that was her whole book, and yeah. I appreciated her book. I thought it was great because yeah. that was the that was her story. I mean, exactly. I loved her book. I yeah. thought it was a great book. Yeah. I did too. Yeah. And, 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 and it's I like it because it stands for what it is, and it's, yeah. it takes it. So my book, since I had a do over, uh, I chose uh, not to include that. You know, so there's there's some new chapters. Um, to obviously get you up to date or as much right. as we could yep. in 10 years. And then um, there was an interview that Hannes uh, Johnson had done with Tam Payton that I thought was a pretty uh, extensive interview. And, and so I approached him and said, hey, do, are you cool if I include your, your entire interview in this new version of the book? And he was, you know, he was honored that I asked and appreciative that I thought it was such a good interview because it was because you love him or hate him the rollers were not on the phone today yeah. talking yeah. if it is Tam Payton period yeah, he was, right. whatever so he was he was matter. a genius the other stuff doesn't matter it's like having a conversation about the Beatles and not uh, you know understanding that it doesn't happen without Brian exactly and funnily enough, for the same reasons, they both had the same sort of attractions or whatever. And I don't want to get into Tam and his, you know, his, right. his thing, but I will say that that interview that he did uh, with Hans was, uh, you know, it was beyond the surface. It gave him a chance to really express himself in good or, good or bad ways. But I just felt like, okay, this is better narrative than, than three or four girls who hung around with him in L.A. and in the late 70s and you know yeah. uh, because I mean at the end of the yeah. day at the end of the day that story is probably not that unique there were other cities other girls other hotels <laughs> you know oh yeah sure yeah. they were young men young men can I, can I ask a question sure um is it possible to buy your book is it possible I'm sorry to buy your book if somebody after hearing this podcast wants to read your book where can um, we it? Do you know what? In, in the, it was about two years ago um, that the publisher approached me and said, listen, you can keep this thing in print, but we're going to actually need you to pay. Because oh, I guess no. it, well, it's, it's not, not a lot of money, but it's money um, yeah. to keep it in print. And, and I thought, you know what, probably anybody that's going to want to read it has probably already read it. Uh, so rather than send a couple grand to, uh, to keep it in print with that particular publisher, now I've learned since that I could have taken it, because it's my manuscript, I own it lock, stock, and barrel. So I, I could have, uh, so I suppose I could still put it out again. But it's, it's available through Amazon uh, as a Kindle book. So you can, you can download it and read it on your Kindle and you can still see all the, all the pictures and the cover art and all of that. But as far as, okay. as, far as actual paperback copies go, I think as 
as of 2017 or 18. It's officially out of print, which is nuts because I saw a copy of it on eBay for like $80. And, oh, wow. Uh, I know, and I had to pay 80 bucks to buy a copy of my own book. Wow. So oh, my gosh. That says something. <laughs> That's I awesome. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wayne, tell us about the um, the original Idol show that you were involved with that reunited Duncan and Ian for a time. Thanks. That was fun. So I got out of radio day to day and moved to Las Vegas to work with radio as opposed to on radio uh, for a time show company called um, Consolidated Resorts. Their big, their big uh, property is called Tahiti Village. It's still there, but um, they were huge timeshare company. I was exposed to them because uh, in radio, they would approach us and say, hey, how would you like to do your morning show live from Las Vegas? And yeah. uh, of course you want to do that. And they would, they would fly you out, uh, put you up, and you can do your show. And of course, at a cost, which meant you had to, you had to give out their 800 number on the, on the air, right? Sure. Well, I experienced that as a program director and morning guy and thought it was great. So did our listeners. And... Uh, um, they asked me if I wanted to come to Vegas and work for them, and I and I decided I did. So I moved there to uh, be their national promotions director. And while I was there doing that as my day job, I started to meet a lot of the people that were involved on the entertainment side of things. And now keep in mind, I had already managed uh, Duncan at that point for a long time. Uh, so my whistle had been wet, let's just say. I really am attracted to the whole performance side of things and management. And so I uh, was like, okay, well, what's not being done? What could be a cool like concept for the casinos? And uh, uh, I came up with the idea of the original Idols as a... Uh, uh, touring production and the only litmus test or the litmus test I guess was every one of the acts had to have spent uh, some time on the bedroom walls of a uh, teenage girl you know? <laughs> and, oh boy <laughs> and within a certain you know realistic you okay it doesn't make any sense to put you know Bobby Sherman out with you know Sean Cassidy right they don't they don't share a fan base okay uh, but in about a 10 year span, I figured that that way you get older sister, maybe younger sister, you know, if, if they're five years apart, you can maybe get them both, plus their husbands, you know, to buy t-shirts, of course, at the end of the show. And so uh, I went about the idea of casting this thing, and um, the Rollers was, of course, the first thought I had. And um, I went to Duncan and I said, uh, hey, what do you think, you wanna do this? And he said, well, who would I do it with? And, you know, his first choice was Eric. And um, I don't think Eric wanted anything to do with the Rollers at that point. Mm -hmm. So um, then we went from there. And he said, you know, it's easy because then you go, okay, well, check them all off the list. You know, Les had his touring version of the band, but the idea of bringing them over to be available at a moment's notice, that's not going to work. So it would probably have to be... Uh, U.S. based, um, so one and one is two. Hello, Ian Mitchell, right? Yeah, yeah. So we asked Ian and, and Wendy, and they were all in. Uh, so we thought, okay, well at least we've got them on board. Now, how do we build it? You know, because uh, you need the name, or at least some version of the name. And uh, Ian was at that time doing shows as uh, uh, Ian Mitchell's Bay City Rollers, I think. Yep, we saw that too. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I think that's how he was building it. Um, and Duncan wasn't doing anything except being Duncan. I mean, he, he had just moved back from South Africa, so he was he hadn't really done anything rollerish in a while. Um, so we uh, we got them on board. Then I went and uh, basically reunited the Cowsills after ten years. Oh wow! They hadn't played, they hadn't played a note together, and you know, timing is everything. I. I uh, I reached out to uh, Bob Cowsill, um, found out he was playing at a pub in LA, and I called the pub and left a message. They put a sticky note on, I learned all this later. They put a sticky note on his uh, piano, uh, or I'm sorry, on his guitar stand, and um, that guitar stand note stayed there for like two months. And he kept looking at it going, Wayne Coy, I don't know who this guy is. And finally, he returned my call after like two months. 
and uh, and I just shot it to him straight. I'm like, look, I'm putting together hopefully a lineup of teen idols. We'll have a, a common backing band, but you know, you can play as much as makes sense up in front, and you'll play your hits, and then get off to the next one, kind of like the old Dick Clark. Uh, you know, tours from way back in the 60s, you know, that, that was my idea. Or the Happy Together Tour, which had started in the 80s, was a good a good uh, template as well. Yeah. So he understood what I wanted to do, and he said, listen, we haven't really played together, uh, me and my siblings, so, I, you know, we kind of had a little time apart, and, and we've lost two of our brothers. They had lost uh, uh, Bill and Barry within a very short time, you know, of each other. Um, but he said, I'm going to be in Las Vegas, let's get together. So I took him out to breakfast. And, you know, keep in mind, I'm meeting him face to face for the very first time. And to show you just how deep the loss of their brothers was with him, because he was original. He and Bill pretty much started the councils, you know. Yeah. Um, because they were Beatle fans living in Rhode Island, and they wanted to be the Beatles. You know, that's kind of how it all started. Well, once we started talking about the idea of him playing with Paul and Susan, uh, he just broke down. Oh, wow. I, didn't to, I didn't know how to act, because I'm meeting this guy for the very first time, and he's literally sobbing over his pancakes at the table with me. And... Um, and he looked at me through his tears and he said, you are asking me to do something that probably makes more sense now than it ever did. Of course I want to do this. Count me in. I'm going to go talk to my sister and my brother and see if they'll do it. Mm-hmm. And they hadn't played together since the early 90s. Wow. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's really cool. And here they are to this day. Speaking of Happy Together, they're part of the Happy Together tour. Not now in our COVID world, but they will be again when that's gone. And uh, they've had quite the renaissance, the councils have. And, you know, I was a small part of that at the very beginning because they they really were estranged. You know, they didn't stop loving each other, but I just think the loss of their two brothers, you know, Barry died in, uh, in Hurricane Katrina. He drowned. Oh. Oh, wow. you know, I I knew and Bill, uh, Bill was sick for a lot of years and eventually, uh, you know, passed away. So I think it was cathartic for them to get together and sing their hits again. And, uh, and it was so we had councils on board. We had the Bay City Rollers, or at least whatever we were going to call them on board. Uh, Barry Williams was was a green light go as an MC, uh, Greg Brady, because uh, I was working with Anthony Anzaldo, who was managing him. Uh, and he was also our conduit to get to Leif Garrett. Leif, oh, wow. Leif initially uh, said no, and it's because he didn't want anything to do with his uh, his teen idol past. Yeah. You know, he just wanted to play uh, Nirvana songs. <laughs> and and I said to uh, Anthony, who then I think translated to Leif, um, "Listen, this is an opportunity for you to." Get back out, because nobody knows where you've been except on the, you know, on the pages of the National Enquirer, because he'd had trouble legally. Uh, you know, he'd been arrested a time or two, and it was like, uh, this is a chance for you to wipe the slate clean. And so what? You know, you got to play. You know, I was made for dancing or whatever, and and you're gonna find out people love you for that music and for that time, and let's give you an opportunity to do at least one song that that isn't from your past and you know that's the that's the give we'll give you we'll give you a chance to do out of five songs six songs whatever it is you can do one or two that are off the beaten track that weren't run around sue you know right yeah so he said okay under those terms i'll do it so now we've got um you know i would say Leif and the rollers both are you know pretty equivalent in terms of their impact on teens and the council certainly got a lot of love you know, in the uh, in the late '60s and into the early '70s, mm-hmm. uh, reached out to Tony DeFranco. He was selling houses and still is um, for Sotheby's in Southern California, and he was kind of like, "Listen, you know, I make a lot of money doing real estate, and it would have to be a pretty good payday for me to do this." And I couldn't guarantee anything at that point. I'm like, I don't even know if anybody is even going to salute this flag. I need to put together a lineup. Right, right. <laughs> So he was like, hey, I'm not going to say no forever, but no for now. Sean Cassidy said, uh, no, uh, 
I'll keep my options open. He goes, you know, I haven't sung those songs in years. Uh, I walked off. He told me, he goes, I walked off the field at the Houston Astrodome um, in 1980, whatever, and didn't look back. He goes, from that point on, that part of my career was over. I'm really enjoying myself in TV and doing what I'm doing. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's something I would feel comfortable doing. And I said, well, what, what if we book like a, not just a regular casino show, but what if we got like a really big venue, um, you know, outdoors, stadium, you know, big, let's say the Hollywood Bowl, would you do it? And he goes, uh, he goes, well, the Hollywood Bowl, hell no. He goes, but if you want to get me to Boston or New York, he goes, at least that's far enough away from everybody who I have to see on a daily basis in, in L.A. <laughs> uh, so maybe I would. So he had a real good sense of humor about it, but he passed. Uh, David Cassidy said no because he was doing his own thing. David Jonas said no initially, but uh, down the road, and you know, this is way later, uh, he actually came on board. Oh, wow. Yes, that was cool. And then Bo Donaldson and the Haywoods, because I was looking for someone, again, who, who could meet the litmus test, because Bo and the band got a uh, ton of coverage in Tiger Beat. Sure. Um, not so much 16 or Teen Beat or 17. For whatever reason, they were they're pretty specific to uh, the law firm publication, as was Tony DeFranco. Yeah. And Leif was more of a Tiger Beat guy. And I get it now because I know what that meant was they had deals with the record companies, mm -hmm. you know. Didn't know it at the time. But anyway, uh, Bo I thought was perfect. You know, he didn't front the band, so he just needed a lead singer. Um, we got one for him. Uh, and they agreed, you know, to be the backing band for Leif and anybody else that would need it. The councils were kind of self-contained, but, you know, it was just the three of them, so they needed a drummer and a keyboard player, and, uh, and it worked. So we toured 2000, well, we did 2006, New Year's Eve, at the Flamingo. Oh, wow. Huge show. Great show. Ian and Duncan were fabulous. Um, every bit of it was exactly what we needed. I got, I got pictures, I got video, you know, so to be able to put together a nice promo pack to move forward... Oh, I forgot that this is important. We uh, we licensed the name because uh, the federal trademark in the United States is owned by Jeff Hubbard uh, in Indiana. Okay. And so I reached, reached out to Jeff. You know, and Jeff had done tours in the past with Woody and Eric and Alan. And, um, you know, so he, he was on the inside, sort of. Uh, but he was fine. So we agreed that... Okay, we're going to use it for this one show, and if it turns into something, then we'll have to do a long-term licensing deal where we pay you X amount of dollars per show uh, to be able to use the federal trademark without any pushback. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, that's that was that was what we agreed to do. So we were we were able to put uh, Ian and Duncan and that band on stage and build them as the Bay City Rollers without any other you know, asterisks, you know, which is easier. It's always easier if you can if you can use the name. You know, ask Foreigner. There's not one original member in that band and hasn't been for years except occasionally Nick Jones. And they make quite a living because they, they can use the name, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, so that's what we do with the Rollers. Had a great first show. Put together all this promo. Then, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Well, isn't there always a wah, wah, wah? when it comes to our favorite boy band. Find out next week what went wrong. Thanks for listening, and until then, keep on rolling. No matter what, no matter who, no matter where, keep on rolling.